This presentation is on Sherwood Anderson's uh, collection of stories, Winesburg, Ohio, and the focus is the concept of the grotesque, which is essential to understanding how characters uh, develop in the individual stories in the book. This idea of the grotesque is introduced right off the bat in the very, very first story, the book of the grotesque. Uh, the first story in the book, it's not much of a story really, more of a kind of preface or introduction that establishes the theme of the 23 stories that follow. And that theme is the grotesque. If you turn to the dictionary, you will find lots of different definitions of the word grotesque. This definition, which I found in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, uh, hits pretty close to the mark. Departing markedly from the natural, the expected, or the typical. And there are not many characters in Weisberg, Ohio, who seem normal or typical to me. So in that sense, they are all grotesque. The next logical question then would be to ask what makes Sherwood Anderson's characters unnatural or abnormal, and why should it even matter to us? So to answer the first question, we will turn to the character of the writer in the book of the grotesque. And again, like I said, not a whole lot happens in this story. There's a writer, his bed is too, too low to the floor. He uh, hires a carpenter to come in and make some modifications to the bed so that he can lie there and look out the window. But none of that is really as important as what the old man is writing about. And we're gonna focus on that here because that's where this idea of the grotesque gets developed. So we're told that he's very old and that he's met many people in his lifetime and known them in a way that we might find unusual. And I'm quoting from uh, page eight here. He has known these people in a pecu peculiarly intimate way that was different from the way in which you and I know people. In the bed, he has a dream. And, and in the dream, he sees all these people that he had met in his life. And uh, uh, they all come before him in a kind of procession. Figures began to appear before his eyes. They were all grotesques. All of the men and women that the writer had ever known had become grotesques. So now what does that mean? How did they become grotesques? Uh, is this something he's just imagining? Is this the way they were in their lives? Well, he gets out of the bed and decides to start writing about this in a book. And the title of the book is The Book of the Grotesque. And the narrator of the story tells us that the book had this one central thought and that a simple statement of it would be something like this. That in the beginning, when the world was young, there were a great many thoughts, but no such thing as a truth. Man made the truths himself, and each truth was a composite of a great many vague thoughts. All about in the world were the truths, and they were all beautiful. There was the truth of virginity and the truth of passion, the truth of wealth and of poverty, of thrift and of profligacy, of carefulness and abandon. But if these truths were originally beautiful, something happens, something happens to change that. The people came along. Each, as he appeared, snatched up one of the truths, and some who were quite strong snatched up a dozen of them. It was the truths that made the people grotesques. The moment one of the people took one of the truths to himself, called it his truth, and tried to live his life by it, he became a grotesque, and the truth he embraced became a falsehood. Now that last paragraph there, on page nine, the one I just read, is, is really the key to unlocking the mystery of the characters in the stories. This explains, uh, in a uh, sort of broad theoretical way, um, how the characters become grotesque. Now, how each individual character illustrates this has to be examined by looking at the stories, of course. And we'll look at one in just a minute. But basically the idea here is that that a grotesque individual is someone who has latched on to something, some idea, and can't let it go. And it, 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 
it gives them a kind of tunnel vision perhaps uh, puts them in a box if you want to use cliched metaphors um, in a way that distorts how they see themselves or how they see the world around them and this of course has negative consequences for them so here are some questions for us to think about as we read the individual stories what do characters say or do that makes them grotesque what's the idea they hold on to too tightly what is the false truth they believe about themselves or about the world they live in what happened in the past that made the character turn out this way what factors have contributed to their condition What effect does a character's being grotesque have on his or her life in the present? How has it impacted their status in the community and personal relationships, relationships with family or friends or romantic relationships? So these are the questions to think about as you read each story, think about each character. We're going to look at hands, which concerns the character Wing Biddlebaum. So we're gonna start with that first set of questions. What do characters say or do that makes them grotesque? What is the false truth they believe about themselves or about the world they live in? So we'll look at Wing Biddlebaum first. What makes him atypical or unusual? Well, it's his hands, of course. The story of Wing Biddlebaum, and I'm quoting directly from the book, and I will for the rest of this presentation quote directly from the book. The story of Wing Biddlebaum is a story of hands. Their restless activity, like unto the beating of the wings of an imprisoned bird, had given him his name. The hands alarmed their owner. He wanted to keep them hidden and looked with amazement at the quiet, inexpressive hands of other men who worked beside him in the fields or passed driving sleepy teams on country roads. When he talked to George Willard, Wayne Biddlebaum closed his fists and beat with them upon a table or on the walls of his house. The action made him more comfortable. If the desire to talk came to him when the two were walking in the fields, he sought out a stump or the top board of a fence, and with his hands pounding busily, talked with renewed ease. So for Wing Biddlebaum, his hands are part of his expression. The part of the way that he can touch is one of the ways that he communicates with people. Um, and we see this in one of his interactions with George Willard that's described in the story. And what's he talking to George Willard about? Well, by a fence he had stopped and beating like a giant woodpecker upon the top board had shouted at George Willard, condemning his tendency to be too much influenced by the people about him. You are destroying yourself, he cried. You have the inclination to be alone and to dream, and you are afraid of dreams. You want to be like others in town here. You hear them talk and you try to imitate them. He launched into a long, rambling talk, speaking as one lost in a dream. Out of the dream, Wing Biddlebaum made a picture for George Willard. In the picture, men lived again in a kind of pastoral golden age. Across a green, open country came clean-limbed young men to gather about the feet of an old man who sat beneath a tree in a tiny garden and who talked to them. Wing Biddlebaum became wholly inspired. For once he forgot the hands. Slowly they stole forth and lay upon George Willard's shoulders. Something new and bold came into the voice that talked. You must try to forget all you have learned, said the old man. You must begin to dream. From this time on, you must shut your, your ears to the roaring of the voices. But then something happens to Wing Biddlebaum. He stops, he becomes terrified, and he ends the conversation with George. Pausing in his speech, Wing Biddlebaum looked long and earnestly at George Willard. His eyes glowed. Again, he raised the hands to caress the boy, and then a look of horror swept over his face. So Wing Biddlebaum sees something wrong with himself, and he doesn't quite understand it, but he believes it has something to do with his hands and the way that he expresses himself, the way that he communicates with others. And his belief that there's something wrong with him, something wrong with the way, he, the way he communicates, has caused him to shut himself off 
from others, to disconnect from the community, and uh, to uh, to avoid having the kinds of relationships that that he starts to have here with George Willard. So how did he come to be this way? How did he come to be terrified of his of his own hands and the way that he communicates and expresses himself? Well, that's the second set of questions that I showed you earlier. What happened in the past that made the character turn out this way? What factors have contributed to their condition? So looking at Wing Biddlebaum, we learned that he was a school teacher before moving to Winesburg, Ohio. He worked in Pennsylvania. Uh, and that he was a good teacher. Uh, we don't get the sense that there was any impropriety on his part. Uh, he was a good teacher. The boys liked him, and he had an effect on them. He inspired them. He opened their minds, and they began to grow under his counsel and his care. And here's a description uh, from page 15 of the way he taught his lessons. Here and there went his hands, caressing the shoulders of the boys, playing about the tousled heads. As he talked, his voice became soft and musical. There was a caress in that also. In a way, the voice and the hands, the stroking of the shoulders and the touching of the hair were a part of the schoolmaster's effort to carry a dream into the young minds. By the caress that was in his fingers, he expressed himself. Under the caress of his hands, doubt and disbelief went out of the minds of the boys, and they began also to dream. But then something happens to, uh, to, to Wing Biddlebaum. Actually, his name at this point is Adolph Myers. He changes his name when he relocates to Winesburg, Ohio. Something bad happens, and this trauma is going to change him forever. And then the tragedy. A half-witted boy of the school became enamored of the young master, has a crush on him. In his bed at night, the boy imagined unspeakable things, and in the morning went forth to tell his dreams as facts. Strange, hideous accusations fell from his loose-hung lips. Through the Pennsylvania town went a shiver. Hidden, shadowy doubts that had been in men's minds concerning Adolf Myers were galvanized into beliefs. And what happens after this, of course, is that, that Adolf Myers gets beaten, and... Uh, a lynch mob forms in the town. A bunch of men get together with their, their, their pitchforks and torches and a hang rope, and they're going to go get him, and they're going to string him up from a tree to punish him for things that, in fact, he didn't actually do. And he runs away. He runs to Winesburg, Ohio. Now he has negative feelings about himself. He thinks there's something wrong with the way he communicates, something wrong with his hands, maybe even something evil about his hands. And he retreats from the world. And the effect that this has on him is it puts him in isolation. Like I said before, he, he stops communicating. He distances himself from people, including George Willard. He is detached from his community. He lives the life of a hermit. Um, he lives alone. But he still feels this desire to communicate. And we see that painfully expressed in the, at the very end of the story. So what effect does a character's being grotesque have on his or her life in the present? How has it impacted their status in the community and personal relationships? We can just see it all right here in this passage. When the rumble of the evening train that took away the express cars loaded with the day's harvest of berries had passed and restored the silence of the summer night, he went again to walk upon the veranda. In the darkness, he could not see the hands, and they became quiet. Although he still hungered for the presence of the boy, and he's talking about George Willard, who was the medium through which he expressed his love of man, the hunger became again a part of his loneliness and his waiting. Lighting a lamp, Wing Biddlebaum washed the few dishes soiled by his simple meal, and setting up a folding cot by the screen door that led to the porch, prepared to undress for the night. A few stray white bread crumbs lay on the cleanly washed floor by the table. Putting the lamp upon a low stool, he began to pick up the crumbs, carrying them to his mouth one by one with unbelievable rapidity. In the dense blotch of light beneath the table, the kneeling figure looked like a priest engaged in some service of his church. 
The nervous, expressive fingers flashing in and out of the light might well have been mistaken for the fingers of the devotee going swiftly through decade after decade of his rosary. So the man who was once a teacher now lives like a solitary monk in uh, a lonely cell, um, eating breadcrumbs off the floor. It's a sad, it's such a sad ending to the story, but it, uh, it, it, it really illustrates this idea of the grotesque completely. We see what, what makes Wing Biddle Baum a grotesque, how he got to be that way, and the way that it has impacted his life. And you can take these questions um, and apply them to, to just about any character, any main character in the stories of Winesburg, Ohio, and observe similar kinds of things, similar patterns. This is a map of Winesburg, Ohio. It is not in our edition of the book, but when the book was originally published, it included a map, and I love it when writers include maps of the places in their imagination. And that's the end of this presentation on introducing the grotesque.